Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve climbing stairs. So this is going to be another dynamic programming problem. And this is definitely more on the easy side, definitely compared to some of the really hard uh, dynamic programming problems that we've been solving recently. But I still think that this is a good problem to really understand the fundamentals, understand, you know, the brute force and taking that brute force, you know, using memoization and then of course getting the true dynamic programming solution. And by the way, if you don't already know, we have been tracking a list of blind 75 questions on this spreadsheet. So today we're going to be solving this dynamic programming one, the climbing stairs problem. So I will be adding the solution once this video is uploaded. And the link will be in the description if you do want to take a look at this sheet. So the problem statement is pretty simple. We're climbing a staircase and it's going to take us n steps to reach the top of the staircase. Every time we take a step, we have two choices of how we can take a step. We can either just take one single step or we can take two steps at once. And all we want to know is how many different ways can we get to the top of the staircase. So let's look at the first example, n equals two. That means we need to climb two steps. So we could draw the picture kind of like this, right? So let's say we start over here, right? This is step zero, basically, when we haven't climbed anything. And our goal is to get up here, which clearly is two steps, right? So starting from here, we know we can make two choices, right? We can take one step and that would land us over here, or we could take two steps and that would land us over here. So already we're seeing one way is to just take two steps, right? That's what this path would take us, right? That's one way we could reach the goal, right? Just taking two steps at once. Now, if we ended up taking one step, then we would be at this position. So from here, we would, we would have that same exact choice, right? We can take one step or we can take two steps. Now, clearly, if we take two steps, we've gone too far, right? We were only trying to climb two steps total. But if we, you know, end up over here, then, you know, that's not going to count as a path, right? So that would not count. But as you can see, if we took one step initially, then we could take another single step and that would be another way. So either this is one way we could reach uh, two steps or we could just take a single double step, right? So clearly there are two different ways we could climb the staircase and that's also the result of this problem. And they basically explain it over here. So let's look at the second example, which is basically if we were climbing three steps instead of two, right? So let's look at the drawing. So once again, we're, we're gonna do the exact same thing that we did, right? From here, we could take one step or we could take two steps, right? And so, so far we'd get here, but remember our goal is to climb three steps. So let's continue. So from here, we could take one step, which would land us at the result, or we could take two steps, which would get us out of bounds, right? That's not what we want to do. So, so far we have found one way to get us to the result, but let's continue that from over here. Again, we can take a single step, which would get us over here, or we can take two steps, which would get us at the result. So now we found two different ways we can get to the last step. And lastly, we still have a path to continue, right? We got here by taking one step and then taking another single step. So here we have two choices, take one step, get to the result or take two steps and get out of bounds. So in the end, we see that there were three different ways we were able to get to this last step. As you can see, this is getting really hard to visualize with a single staircase. A more easy way would be to get a decision tree to visualize. And at every decision, remember, we can take one step or we can take two steps. So, so let's try to visualize the problem like that and see if we can notice any patterns. So let's say we're given n equals five. We're trying to climb five steps. So we can consider just like the previous drawing that we're starting at step zero and our goal is to get to step five. Now, remember, at every given point, we have two decisions to make. We can climb one step or we can climb two steps, right? And depending on the decision that we make, each of these is going to lead to a different path we can take to get to the result. And remember, all we're trying to do is count the number of ways we can get to that result. So in this decision tree, you know, we're going to keep making two decisions at every step. And at the end, we're going to count how many different ways were we able to get to five steps reached. So we can get to step one and we can get to step two. Let's just continue drawing out the decision tree from here. We can make two more decisions. We can take one step, which would get us to two. We can take two steps, get us to three. And similar here, we can take one step, get us to three, two steps, get us to four. From here, we can also take one step, get us to three, two steps, get us to four, 
one step, get us to four, two steps, get us to five. Now here, we can see that we reached the result, right? N equals five. So this is our first path that we could reach to get us to the result, right? You can see we took one step, then we took two steps, then we took another two steps. So this is our result. Once we get to it, that's our base case, right? We're gonna solve this recursively, right? That's pretty much what we're doing. This decision tree is basically recursion, and this is our base case. We wouldn't wanna continue if we got here. So here we would return one. We found one way to get to the result. But for the remaining paths, let's continue. So here we could take one step or two, that'd get us to four, this would get us to five. So you can see once again, we found another way we can get to the results. So, so far we have two different paths that can lead us to step five. And here, let's do the same thing. If we take one step, we get to five. That's the result. If we take two steps, we get to six. That means we overshot, right? We went too far. This is another base case. If this number of steps ever exceeds five, then we're gonna return zero, right? We found zero ways from this path that can reach the result. So now let's continue. Over here, again, we take one step or two, so we'll get to four or five, another path that leads us to the result. And here we can also take one step or two, which would get us five or six. Similarly over here, right? This is another four, so the exact same thing is gonna happen. Do you start to see we're repeating the exact same problem multiple times? How can we better solve this problem knowing that? So now we have another four. We're just gonna repeat the exact same thing that we just did before, right? Take one step or two. We know we're gonna get to a five and we know we're gonna get to a six. So you can see every path led to the base case except for this last one. So let's complete this. We can take one step, which would get five or two steps, six. Okay, so now our entire decision tree is complete. So what's the result gonna be? Remember, red means we're gonna return zero. Green means we're gonna return one. So let's just count the number of greens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there were eight different paths from the beginning that could reach step five. But remember, since we started here, we were asking how many different ways starting at zero can we get to five? And then we got to a sub problem. We got to a sub problem of starting at step one. How many ways can we reach five? From this decision tree alone, we see that there's one, two, three, four, five different ways we can reach the result. And down two, if we're starting at step two, there's three different ways we can reach the result. Now, if you solve the problem like this, basically using recursion, and you could probably do it with depth first search because this is basically a tree, and what would be the time complexity of that? Well, clearly we, you can see that we have two decisions each time. So it's gonna be two to the power of the height of this tree. What's the height gonna be? It's gonna be roughly n equals five, right? You can see that this is gonna be the longest path. So that's roughly the height. So the overall time complexity is gonna be two to the power of n. That's not super efficient, but you can see here, we're repeating the same problem multiple times, right? When we get over here, we're asking how many different ways starting from two can we get to five, right? And down in this decision tree, we found, yes, there were three different ways, right? So then when we get over here, why, why do we have to recompute the exact same thing? Take a look at these two purple blocks I just drew. Notice how this decision tree looks the exact same as this one, because in both cases, we're solving the exact same subproblem. And since we're doing it depth for search, this one is gonna be solved first, right? So if we solve this entire problem, what we said was, okay, we found out starting at step two, there were three different ways to get to step five. So when we get here, why don't we just take that result, store it in memory, store it in DP, or basically this is a cache, right? We're, we're storing it in memory. So then when we get here, we can just say, we already know the result of this, meaning that we don't need to draw out the entire decision tree. We're just gonna skip that all together. We're not gonna draw this, we're not gonna draw that, and we're not gonna draw any levels of this tree. So as you can see, I'm eliminating all that repeated work by saving that solution. But that's not all, right? We see over here, we're, we're asking a different sub problem. Starting at step three, how many different ways can we get to n equals five? Well, in this case, it was two different ways, right? Notice how this decision tree is the exact same over here, because here we're asking that same question. Starting at step three, what's the number of ways? And since we're doing this step for search, this one is gonna end up being computed before this one. So when we get here, we can just say, we already know the answer is two. So we don't need to run through the entire decision tree again. 
So in this case as well, we can eliminate that repeated work. So I'm just gonna cross this entire thing out. And we're not done yet. See over here, we're asking starting at step four, how many ways can we get to five? That same problem is over here. Notice how they have the exact same decision tree. This one is gonna be computed first because we're doing depth first search. So once again, let's eliminate this repeated work. So now you can see when we do eliminate all that repeated work, this is what our decision tree ends up looking like. And this is roughly O of N. This is linear time solution. Reason being we're only solving each subproblem once, right? So we know that the first subproblem, the original problem is starting at zero. Then we get a subproblem of one, two, three, four all the way to five, which is our base case, right? So each of these sub problems is just being solved once. N is five. So overall, the time complexity is big O of N. And this is basically the, the dynamic programming solution where we are caching the result, AKA memoization. So we're using memoization. But this problem can actually be solved with a true dynamic programming solution. As you can see, starting at the result, the, the result of zero depends on the subproblem, this one, right? And this subproblem depends on another subproblem, which depends on another subproblem, which depends on another subproblem, which depends on our base case. So why don't we start at the bottom, solve the base case, and then work our way up to the original problem at zero, right? Why don't we start at the bottom, work our way up? This is called a bottom up. This is called a bottom up dynamic programming approach. So that's what I'm gonna show you. We're gonna start at the base case and then work our way up. So remember we're starting at position zero and our goal is to get to the fifth step, right? Each time we can take one step or we can take two steps, right? So I'm gonna be storing our result in an array called DP. So we're gonna have a position in DP all the way from index zero, all the way up to index N, which is gonna be our input value, remember? So remember we're, we're at the base case initially, right? What's the base case gonna be? Well, at the last step, if we start here, how many different ways can we land here? Well, that's just gonna be one, right? That's our default value. So now that we solved that, we are able to solve this one, right? Because remember, this problem depends on the subproblem of this. So from here, let's say we're starting here, we can take one step, which lands us at the result. We can take two steps, which lands us out of bounds, right? So how many different ways from here can we reach the goal? Again, it's gonna be one. And do you notice how this is always going to be the case? Even if we had something like n equals 100, so let's say this was actually 100 and this was 99, this would always be one, right? This is always gonna be one because it's at the goal. And starting from here, it's also always gonna be one because we can take one step, which would get us to the result, or we could take two steps, which would get us out of bounds. So no matter what the n, the input value n is, this is always gonna be the case. It's always gonna be, uh, one, one. Next, we're gonna get to the interesting part. So then we wanna know, okay, how many different ways from here can we reach five? Well, this depends on two sub problems which come after it, right? So we can take one step over here or two steps over here, right? So, and then we get to the sub problem, right? So from four, we don't need to continue to figure out how many different ways from four can we get to five because we just computed that. That's why we're using dynamic programming. That's why we have this array because we already computed starting at four, how many different ways can we reach five? And we also, starting at five, how many different ways can we reach five? That's also one. So what we're gonna do in this value is basically take these next two values, add them together, one plus one, and then we're gonna get two over here. And we're gonna do the exact same thing for this position two. So we know here we could take one step or two steps, right? So what we wanna do from here, three, is find out how many different ways can we reach five. We just computed that, that's two. And from four, we wanna know how many different ways can we reach five. We also already computed that, that's one. So what we can do is take these two values, add them together, and that's gonna be what we put here. So starting at two, we can get to five, three different ways. And at this point, I bet you probably get the idea. We're gonna do the exact same thing over here. So what value are we gonna put over here? Just take these next two values, add them together, three plus two is gonna be five. 
And remember, this is what we were originally trying to compute. This is going to be the result. It depends on only two subproblems, which, which are listed right after it, 5 plus 3. That's going to be 8. So that's the result. If you're familiar with what the Fibonacci sequence is, or the Fibonacci numbers, that's exactly what we're doing right now. We're starting at the base case of 1, 1, adding these two values to get the next result. Then we're adding these two values to get 3. Then we're adding these two values to get 5. Then we're adding these two values to get 8. So you may or may not be familiar with it, but that's what we're doing. And you may have also noticed we're using extra memory, right? We're having an entire array size equals n. That's going to be O of n extra memory. But is it actually needed to have an entire array? Notice how each value, such as this one, only depends on the two values that come after it. And this one only depended on the two values that came after it. So in reality, we don't need to have an entire array. We just need to have two different variables. Let's initialize the two variables like this. One is going to be this position. Two is going to be this position. Because starting from here, we want to know how many different ways could we reach the result if we took one step. That's why this is called one. And if we took two steps, that's why this is called two. And we're basically going to be computing this next value, right? And once we compute this next value, we're going to shift our one variable over here. And we're going to shift our two variable over here. And we're going to keep doing that until we get to the result of zero. And if we initialize two initial variables one and two as values one how many different values do we have to compute that come after it in this case you can see we have to compute four values right so basically we compute n minus one values we have to loop n minus one times and then when our one variable ends up getting in this position that's what we're going to return as the result so this was a really long explanation because we did a lot of analysis, but when I actually show you the code, it's going to be really simple using this idea of two variables being shifted n minus one times. So as I said from the drawing explanation, we're going to have two variables, one and two. Both are going to be initialized as one. And then we're just going to loop through n minus one times. So for i in range n minus one, and we're going to continuously update these two variables one and two. So the first thing I'm going to do is update one. One is going to be set to one plus two, right? Because we're just adding the two previous values and then getting the new result. So one is being updated and we would also want to shift two to whatever the previous value of one was. But you can see that we're updating one before we actually shift two. So what we're actually going to do is store one in a temporary variable before we actually update it. And then we're going to set two to the temporary variable so that we don't end up setting it to one plus two. We, we just want it to be set to one. So we're going to set two equal to temp. Once this loop goes through n minus one times, we're going to end up just returning whatever one happens to land on. And that is the entire solution. We went through so much headache just to get to these five lines of code. So I hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.